Thank you for joining us. In our continuing series of interviews with outstanding leaders in politics, science, education and law, our guest today is Floyd Abrams. He's recognized as the most famous expert on constitutional law and many arguments in the briefs he has written before the United States Supreme Court have actually been adopted as United States constitutional interpretive law as it relates to the First Amendment and free speech. Mr. Abrams will share some of his thoughts on this and other subjects following these messages. You know you need CoQ10 and fish oil for your heart. You also know you need a multivitamin to maintain your health. But what you don't know is that an award-winning CoQ10, fish oil, and multivitamin are all made by Life Extension. Why settle for less than the power of science, the power of life, the power of Life Extension? At Gardens Wellness Center, we provide a full menu of holistic services under one roof. Services to heal the body through chiropractic care, acupuncture, and colon hydrotherapy, and services to heal the mind through hypnotherapy, neurolinguistic programming, and life coaching. We practice functional and Chinese medicine and offer a full herbal pharmacy. Visit us today and take charge of your health. Find magic again. Sprout by HP. With Intel RealSense technology inside, now you can bend the rules of creativity outside. With us now is Mr. Floyd Abrams. It's a pleasure and honor to have you on the show, Good sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here. Your name is synonymous with the First Amendment. That's because the initials are the same. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Why is the First Amendment so much involved in litigation and why are people uh, attacking certain questions with regard to First Amendment rights? Well, part of it is because the First Amendment is sort of counterintuitive. That is to say, it seems to allow speech that a lot of people think is really bad speech. I mean, most speech don't need the First Amendment to protect it. I'm not sure if I've ever said anything that anybody would threaten me or jail me or anything for saying. The, the speech that gets in trouble, the speech that's limited, uh, tends to be uh, more opinionated, maybe more radical of it very often in American history, more radical uh, uh, and highly controversial. Uh, so the cause, as it were, of the First Amendment is one uh, which uh, uh, has required uh, lawyers to play a major role uh, in persuading the courts that notwithstanding the sometimes unattractive quality of some speech, that uh, it has to be protected. And we are unique in the world in the degree to which we protect speech. Uh, there's simply no comparison between the level we protected and our friends in Canada or in the UK or even in Israel, or we, we, we go much farther than any other country in protecting it in the broadest range of ways. Well, the media loves the First Amendment. Yes, well, the media loves it in part because it protects the media. They aren't always so protective of it when it protects others. Uh, but certainly when the press is involved, the media understands very well uh, the need for very broad, not absolute, but very broad protection of uh, free expression. Yet the media also is guilty of lying by omission often, accentuating misdeeds on one side, ignoring them on the other. What are your thoughts with regard to that? Well, it's true that uh, you know, uh, when you protect free speech, it means you protect speech very often even when it's wrong or even when it's biased, uh, if for no other reason that we don't trust the government, any government agency, 
even the courts to make decisions uh, about uh, truth or falsity, except in very narrow circumstances, a libel case, for example. But uh, we stay away from allowing the Congress or the President or the courts to make content distinctions, to decide one sort of speech or one view uh, of one subject or another is to be allowed and to be not just the official version, but the only version. What recent cases would you like to share with our audience? Uh, just uh, sort of skimming through cases uh, I've uh, worked on uh, since I started in 1971. I'll pick a case in the year 2000 in which we represented the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, not a press case, uh, an art case, but a case in which Mayor Giuliani uh, sought to shut the museum down, basically, uh, because it had an art ex exhibition which, of which he disapproved, uh, which he thought was sacrilegious, uh, and uh, otherwise he thought uh, should not be uh, funded to any degree by the city. And so he stepped in, sought to cut off funding immediately and was overruled by the courts uh, in doing so. What was his objection? What was it about the art museum? Uh, the art, uh, one of the works of art by a Nigerian-English artist uh, called the Black Madonna, uh, which uh, showed a woman one would not have known, uh, at least in Western society, to be uh, a picture of, of the Madonna. But on it uh, were sparkling uh, things which uh, came from the dung of elephants. And that was something which is part of Nigerian art, uh, that they use that sort of uh, sparkle uh, on their art. Uh, the mayor said that was sacrilegious. Uh, we have no notion in American law of sacrilege. We have no notion in American law of uh, heresy. Uh, we have no notion in American law of stifling speech because a mayor or a president uh, thinks it is uh, uh, hate speech or, or speech deeply uh, 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 troubling to minorities. And sometimes you have cases, this, this may not have been one of them, but sometimes you have cases in which the speech is deeply troubling uh, by its nature, uh, but in which our law protects it, and our law alone protects it. I mean, there, there was an international agreement signed some years ago called the International Covenant on Political and Civil Rights signed by all the Western democratic countries, including the United States, and which basically said that speech which denigrates people because of their race or religion, perhaps they said of sex uh, as well, uh, uh, is, uh, and, and threatens in some way their well-being, uh, should be avoided, should be prevented, and states should take action to keep the speech from being uttered. Uh, the United States signed that, but also put on it, this was under President Carter, uh, a, what's called a reservation, saying, but of course this is all subject to the American Constitution, which is to say, we don't have laws banning such speech. We don't have laws, we can't have laws banning speech even of this deeply offensive and sometimes harmful uh, uh, nature. We, we could allow, we do allow, uh, criminal penalties for certain types of threats. We allow criminal penalties where there's an incitement to some sort of illegal action with the intent and the likelihood of causing illegal action. But uh, unlike uh, Canada, uh, all our democratic friends uh, around the world, uh, we don't accept the notion that even hateful speech 
should be uh, subject to being banned or punished in any way. What an interesting concept, and yet in other cultures, offending a religion, in this case Islam, you get a fatwa. Oh, yeah. Sure. And, and you know, there are many, many uh, situations in which efforts have been made uh, at the UN by Muslim countries, in particular, uh, to have the, the sternest uh, f element of limitation of speech, which is viewed as uh, critical of, uh, harmful to, disparaging of uh, other religions. Uh, now, in many of those countries, Pakistan, to take one, uh, uh, people have been jailed. Uh, I said Pakistan because I think of a particular case, but. But this has occurred in a number of Muslim countries. Two things have occurred. One, a lot of people have been injured, hurt, killed, uh, because of uh, what, ha what is viewed as what we would call uh, heresy, uh, uh, saying things contrary to their notion of, of God uh, and the like. Uh, and second, they have laws making that a crime. In fact, it's more common in the world to have the laws than not to have the laws. Uh, and so while <clears throat> democratic countries tend to take it easy uh, on those laws, uh, in France, for example, it's, it is a violation of law to say critical things uh, of uh, religious uh, communities uh, and the like. Uh, but the penalties are very slight. I mean, they're small fines. It's really more of a way of expressing their societal disapproval rather than putting people in jail. Uh, but even that would be unconstitutional here. I find it reprehensible for anyone to insult and incite hatred. But speaking of freedom of press and free speech, we have the incident of people showing these illustrations, these cartoons, criticizing or ridiculing Islam, and that resulted here in the United States with several deaths. Well, I think we've had certain situations uh, in which the motivation for showing certain cartoons and the like was simply a sort of uh, stick in the eye, simply to offend. We protect that speech. I think it's necessary to protect it, but you don't have to admire it. Uh, to protect it. Um, so uh, I thought, by way of example, that the Danish cartoons uh, uh, where uh, in Denmark a few years ago they had uh, cartoon illustrations of leaders of all faiths in the world, but because they included Muhammad and because that was viewed as sacrilege, uh, they had enormous uh, safety issues, uh, legal issues, uh, uh, and the like, uh, uh, to the point that uh, uh, a lot of uh, publications, the most, uh, the best known Western publications, uh, declined to publish the cartoon, however relevant it was to their story, uh, and that was the same in France recently with the uh, you know, horrible murders uh, of the uh, French uh, cartoonists uh, where American publications had to make a difficult decision. That the head of CNN said the only reason they weren't putting on, by way of illustration, even one of the cartoons was fear of harm to their journalists. Or as he put it, we have wives and children here uh, of our journalists. Other publications made what I think was a braver decision and a more journalistically sound one. Uh, the Washington Post, for example, the Wall Street Journal, uh, published uh, an example uh, uh, without which it's very difficult to understand what the, what the argument was about, what the, what the offense was taken for doing. Um, but that was a matter where very serious American journalists disagreed amongst themselves about what was proper and what was safe uh, for them to do. But as a legal matter, only in America 
for better or worse, but only in America is it clear that that sort of material is protected, that and much worse, much material which, which people would, would view as, as indefensible on moral grounds is, is protected here, all in the service of avoiding governmental decision making about what to print, what to say, what to think, uh, a sort of freedom of conscience, freedom of information and the like. Uh, and we take chances by doing that. I mean, we run some risks. Uh, the other countries run the risks of suppression of speech. We run the risks of allowing speech. So much of it is so distasteful. Before we change topics, I'd like to ask you a little bit about journalism in the United States and how some reporters have actually demonstratively left their jobs, walked off the set, because they weren't allowed to ask questions they wanted to. What do you focus on that? Well, first, there are circumstances, I'm sure, in which the journalists were morally and journalistically uh, sound. They acted appropriately. They did the right thing in choosing not to be associated with a publication or a broadcaster or the like that uh, didn't allow, you know, uh, what the journalist at least thought was uh, appropriate questioning, appropriate commentary, or the like. That said, I don't think there's a place for the government in that decision making. I think that has to be by the journalist, not by a governmental body determining whether the station had acted appropriately. Speaking of government, big business is another area of interest. And there's litigation that you were involved with, with regard to the FDA. Yes, I was involved in a case <clears throat> uh, in which the uh, FDA uh, was threatening to bring litigation, potentially criminal a litigation, against a drug manufacturer uh, for saying uh, truthful and non-misleading things about the off-label use of one of its drugs. Uh, off-label in the sense that the uh, drug had been approved for one use with respect to hopefully preventing coronary problems. Um, and doctors are allowed to prescribe drugs that have been approved for any use for any other use. So doctors are free to say, I understand that this drug has been approved for topic A. I think it may be very useful for my patients in topic B. Um, uh, doctors are allowed to do that. Drug companies are allowed to fill prescriptions. Uh, pharmacies can fill prescriptions. Drug companies can make whatever money they make in doing so. But the FDA has been taking the position that when you're talking about off-label use, quote, unapproved, unquote, by them, uses, even if you tell the truth about it, even if you say, as my client was prepared to say, the FDA has not approved this use. Or if you say it hasn't been determined yet, whether this drug does this or that or that, that the question in the case was, well, if you do tell the truth in a reasonably balanced way, if you do tell the truth, can you get in trouble? Uh, and what the court said is that with respect to off-label use, uh, a drug manufacturer was free and uh, could not be criminally punished for saying things that are truthful and non-misleading. Now, you might think that shouldn't have come as a great uh, surprise in a country that defends freedom of speech to such an extent, uh, but in part because it's drugs, and we do look to the FDA for a level of protection of the public with respect to drugs, in part because it's government and a government entity, uh, we have to be very careful about having them limiting speech. Uh, it became a case, and it is a case, of uh, very great significance. Why were they pursuing this so vigorously? What's their motive? 
uh, I don't think their motivation was was anything but the, their general belief that drugs that are approved for one purpose really shouldn't be promoted for any other purpose because there have been situations in the past in which drugs were misused that had been approved for one purpose, thalidomide, thalidomide. years ago. Uh, now, that was not a case in which the information provided was truthful and non-misleading. And the case that I've been involved in, everyone agreed that what we were saying was, uh, in almost all respects, was truthful uh, and non-misleading. But I don't, I don't think the FDA, you know, views themselves as engaged in a form of censorship. The fact is, nonetheless, that they were and are. There's also quite a bit of controversy with regard to the IRS and the allegation that they have deliberately obstructed certain organizations from getting tax exempt status while um, being quite accommodating with others. What is your view on that? I don't think there's any issue at all or any doubt that the United States government, uh, the IRS and any other entity up to and including the president is not allowed to stifle speech or threaten speech or conduct investigations simply because uh, the entity uh, they're looking at uh, disapproves or has different views than the government entity does. Uh, I don't think it's clear yet exactly what animated uh, the Internal Revenue Service in the case that you're talking about. There's no doubt that there's been a great deal of controversy about how to enforce our laws with respect to campaign finance restrictions. And a, a part of that has been a sort of technical area, but as to what sort of coordination is not permitted with respect to campaign uh, finance uh, issues. The IRS people said we were just looking into it, and yes, we were looking into some right-wing organizations. People had complained about, we were looking into it. Uh, look, this is the, an inherent problem with having, uh, with, ha with having a government. We need to have a government, but we have a government. It has certain rules that Congress has set forth. It seeks to enforce them, and sometimes it can enforce them in a uh, dangerously and biased, politicized way. And when that happens, that's when the press is at its most important in exposing activities of that sort. It brings to mind an organization named J Street and people with other views, such as Z Street, with Lori Lowenthal Marcus, trying to get 501c3 status and then alleging viewpoint discrimination after applying to the IRS. It's just as interesting how bias affects even the most benevolent of democracies in the United States of America. It's unfortunate. I'm not knowledgeable about that dispute, so I, I can't really comment on it. Back to the health question. The FDA had this issue and you fought them. And there are other off-label and other products out there that have been proven to be beneficial, yet have run into a lot of obstruction. For example, many aspirins are now advocated, and, and it just so happens at Life Extension Foundation many years ago advocated the use and coenzyme Q10 and many other things. But what are your thoughts with regard to being a little more flexible and open-minded and less repressive from the standpoint of the FDA? Look, I think where the law is going to go and uh, ought to go uh, is to say that if you tell the truth about your product, you, you can't get in trouble about it. That if, if you're not misleading about the product, uh, including off-label use of the product, that you can't get uh, in trouble about it. Uh, that still leaves a lot of areas for analysis and uh, study. What is misleading? What is true? 
what is false. Those are obviously issues that have to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. But once a drug has been approved, and since we live in a society which wisely has said doctors can thereafter prescribe it for any sort of use they think is appropriate, then it seems to me it must be the case, uh, as the recent case I've been working on has, has said, that it must be the case that uh, people can talk about it and talk about it honestly and candidly and try to persuade people to buy their products so long as what they're saying is accurate with respect to their products. Now that would still mean that, that, that the sellers run some risks because who knows who will ultimately make the decision about what's true and what's false, but, but there's no way to deal with that uh, in, a, in a general way. All you can say is uh, the, the one proposition that ought to be central is that uh, if, if a drug has been approved and is otherwise lawful to sell, that you can't stifle the discussion, you can't prevent the public from hearing what, what uh, a seller of it wants to say about the use, this off-label use of it, so long as it's uh, not misleading, so long as it's accurate. Speaking about freedom of speech, and not necessarily in the United States, but in this case Israel, the people there enjoy it and the entire Middle East seems to be deteriorating more and more into chaos. What are your views with regard to freedom for women, uh, human rights in other countries surrounding Israel? Well, let me say first, I'm married to an Israeli woman, so I know all about freedom of speech. Uh, uh, my wife, I always tell her, is a First Amendment user, uh, that she speaks out uh, when she has views about anything, including me. Uh, that said, um, uh, Israel is really the only country in the Middle East which uh, continually and continuously from its formulation has defended freedom of expression, uh, uh, both on the ground, in the courts, and otherwise. Uh, the Israeli Supreme Court uh, is a jewel. Uh, and even though Israel does not have a written constitution as such, uh, they do have a, a, a basic law which protects freedom of speech in a way that would simply be unthinkable any place else in the Middle East. How interesting. Sir, I'd like to thank you so very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.